Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, How to Diagnose Common Aerorectal Problems, View from the Bottom. The information presented by the expert is not used to be is the information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law saying the expert consent, i.e., a business relationship, where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Dr. Cohen will discuss common anorectal problems, when and how to treat rectal pain, common misconceptions of typical anorectal diseases, standard of care for diagnosis and treatment of anal diseases, and case reviews. To give you a little background about our presenter, Dr. Stephen Cohen is a board-certified colon and rectal surgeon with over two decades of experience. Not only does he continue to practice evidence-based medicine and surgery, but he has made teaching, training, and educating young surgeons his ultimate long-time goal. Dr. Cohen has been involved in the field of forensic medicine since the early 90s and will help guide you on both standard of care and potential causation in many aspects of colon and rectal surgery. Attendees who, who require passcode, the word for today is anal rectal. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You're also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list located at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Dr. Cohen, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you also to the TASA group for allowing me once again to participate to give you all some insight into what really I do on an everyday basis in terms of how we treat very common anorectal problems. Uh, and as you heard, uh, I've been board certified for a couple of decades, continue to teach, train, and educate the medical students and residents. And it never ceases to amaze me how some of the simplest concepts like examining the patient and diagnosing a problem sometimes gets lost, which can obviously lead to a serious outcome. So I want to start by saying that the, this is what I'm going to be talking about is very similar to some of the lectures I give to the medical students on some of the common benign anorectal diseases. And if we follow a logical path of how, we, how the patients present, how we work them up, we can come up with a diagnosis in order to treat some of these conditions. And once we go through some of the conditions and we talk about how they present and the differences they present, then we will talk about some cases that I was involved in on both the plaintiff and the defense, and you'll be able to see how either I was able to uh, explain to the judge and the jury and the and counsel that either this was standard of care, or there was a delay in diagnosis that led to significant harm in the patient. I will tell you that the most common thing that I hear is this statement right here, my butt hurts. Now, I don't expect the patient to know what's going on, right? If God wanted you to see it, he would have put it in front of you. So you can't look back there. So anything that hurts, the patient is assuming that it's hemorrhoids, and I will because that's what they know, that's what they hear, that's what they see on the television commercial. But 50% of the time, the patients that present with anorectal discomfort, it's actually not hemorrhoids. There's other things that live around the anal canal that, as a provider, we need to be able to diagnose, we need to be able to treat, because there are some bad things that can happen back there that may lead to uh, a malpractice claim if there is a delay in some of these diagnoses. The things we're going to talk about today obviously are hemorrhoids. There's different kinds of hemorrhoids. We're going to talk about an anal fissure, 
which is a crack or a tear. We're going to talk about anorectal abscesses and certainly some other anorectal problems we will discuss. And then importantly, at the end, we'll talk about how this relates to forensic medicine and how I've been involved on both sides of the aisle. This is a very nice picture of a hemorrhoid. And as you can see, this is really a coronal section of the distal rectum or anal canal. And what you see here is that there's internal hemorrhoids and there's external hemorrhoids. Very simple. Colorectal surgeons like myself were not that smart. We have to keep it very simple. The inside hemorrhoids belong on the inside. The outside hemorrhoids belong on the outside. Okay? Why do I say that? Because a lot of times patients will be trying to push back in an outside hemorrhoid. It doesn't belong there. Hence, the internal hemorrhoids sometimes can prolapse or stick out of the anal canal. They do belong back on the inside. So let's first talk about an uh, external hemorrhoid. Believe it or not, everybody listening to this uh, webinar me included, we all have hemorrhoids. We all have hemorrhoids. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't have hemorrhoids. Yes, you do. You're, you may not be bothered by your hemorrhoids, but hemorrhoids are just what we call the blood vessels that live around the anal canal. Yours may not be thrombosed, meaning full of blood. You're, you may not be symptomatic, but you have hemorrhoids just like you have an arm, you have a leg, you have an eye, you have an ear. Same thing. So external hemorrhoids, the patient usually has a relatively acute onset of a painful lump. They can feel it. You can see it. And the pain is pretty acute, usually with some type of activity. Did they have a hard bowel movement? Did they strain? Did they help their neighbor move a refrigerator next door? help their children move something. Certainly that can be a precipitating factor. Doesn't always have to be. If the patient comes to me within the first 72 hours with a painful lump, we will generally excise that because I can get you out of pain. It is fantastic to have a patient come in severe pain and in about 15 or 20 seconds with a little numbing medicine, it's actually less painful than being at the dentist's office, I told that to a dentist one time. They were not happy with me, but I don't like the dentist, but I like doing this. A little numbing medicine around, around the base of that thrombose hemorrhoid. You excise it. They walk out in no pain whatsoever. Now, if you've had that painful lump for more than three days or four days and it's getting better on its own, that's fine. We do not have to excise the blue lump. Your body will resorb the blood clot, soaking in a hot tub. We call it a sitz bath. You may have heard that. That's just a hot tub of water. You don't have to put anything in it. It relaxes the sphincter muscle to make you feel better. Topical pain medicine, topical therapy. There's a bunch of different types of products out there. We're definitely not beholden to any product. I will tell you that what I was taught two decades ago, it really doesn't matter what anorectal cream you buy over the counter. They all work essentially the same way, and that is by lubricating the anal canal to have an easier bowel movement. So whether you're using Preparation H or Anusol or Procto Cream or any of the you know 10 different products that you can find over the counter, it's soothing, makes it feel better, it's going to help the thrombosed external hemorrhoid have an easier bowel movement so it's not so painful. So let's move to what's called really internal hemorrhoids. Now, internal hemorrhoids present very differently than an external hemorrhoid. Remember what I said, the external hemorrhoid is either thrombosed full of blood or it's not. So it may be painful if it fills with blood. If it's not full of blood, it's not painful at all. Internal hemorrhoids are the one that generally present with painless, bright red rectal bleeding. Okay, and I'm going to say that again. Internal hemorrhoids usually present with painless, bright red blood per rectum. That's what those letters stand for. 
the reason I say it like that is I have lots of patients that I've seen over the years that says, you know, I'm seeing blood, but nothing hurts. It can't be my hemorrhoids. And I, wait a second. That's the most common way that you're going to present. So hemorrhoids commonly present as painless, bright red rectal bleeding. And we grade them two through four, depending if they prolapse or stick out of the anus. So that picture down in the lower right is really grade four. Grade four, the worst kind of hemorrhoids. God did not make you to have your internal hemorrhoids hanging out of your anus. So if they're hanging out of the anus, that's grade four. Those are the ones that cannot be pushed back in. Grade two hemorrhoids, and I usually have to ask the patient this. They don't normally volunteer this information, is they feel something coming out when they're having a bowel movement, but they reduce spontaneously. And the grade three, and again, you have to ask this question, they will not volunteer this information. I probably wouldn't tell my doctor either, is that when I have a bowel movement, something is coming out and I push them back in with my hand. That's not a fun thing to do, but it makes it feel better to get that tissue back up. And those are grade three hemorrhoids. Not everybody with internal hemorrhoids will have pain. They may or may not have pain. Depends how much tissue is hanging out around the anal canal. So when we're talking about treatments for internal hemorrhoids, we really have three options. We can do medical therapy. So what is medical therapy? Soaking in a hot tub, topical pain medicine, topical cream or suppositories, extra fiber, We're, we strive for a bulky, soft, non-straining bowel movement that will help so it doesn't um, irritate that tissue coming out. You don't want to have a lot of hard stool sitting in the rectum it, that gives a lot of pressure to those hemorrhoids and that can engorge them. The, the goal is to, what I tell patients, when you have a bowel movement, I want you to sit down, feel the urge to go and empty everything out of your left colon. If you have a lot of stool left in that rectum, and you may not feel that, you have to have a certain volume of stool in your rectum to distend the rectum that sends a message to your brain that you have to go. That's the urge to go. But you could still have some stool in your rectum. You don't feel the urge to go. That puts a lot of pressure on the hemorrhoid. You may become symptomatic with bleeding or protrusion. So extra fiber, soft bulky, non-straining bowel movement that will help the, the stool come through. And then we have some various other type of treatment with the hemorrhoids. But what I want to talk about now is the other thing that's actually more common that I see, which is called an anal fissure. So a fissure is a crack or a tear in the lining of the anal canal, and it hurts, okay? The way I explain this to a patient is, that, have you ever been in the cold weather and you get a crack on the corner of your mouth and you open your mouth, it hurts? Same thing. These patients present very differently. They say, Doc, I'm fine if I don't have a bowel movement, but every time the stool's coming through, I am grabbing onto the side, baby, because it is killing me. That's a tear. And in between their bowel movements, it does not hurt. Okay, so it's a crack or a tear, severe pain with bowel movements, usually not all the time, some bright red blood when they wipe. It's usually not dripping in the toilet bowl. What's the treatment of a fissure? Most patients, if, like if I had a hard stool today and I could feel myself tear, they may be able to say, look, I've been really constipated. I felt myself tear. Soaking in a hot tub. Pain medicine, you have to be a little bit careful because that can make you constipated. Topical xylocaine works fantastic. It's a numbing medicine. But you don't really want to give these patients suppositories. Why? Well, think about it. If it hurts coming out, it's going to hurt going back in. So you don't want to put anything in their butt for sure. And if, he, if you've ever... <laughs> If you spend some time with me and you see some of these patients, they don't want you to come near them. I mean, I've had my hand smacked away from their anus on many occasions because they know it's going to hurt going in. So we generally don't give suppositories. It's topical medication. 
topical lidocaine. Again, that's a numbing medicine. That works fantastic, and that's really one of the better treatments um, for this. Third thing I want to talk about before we get into some cases is the third more common, third other common thing that we see is erectile abscess. So erectile abscess present is an infection. There are six or eight glands that live around the anal canal. The most common reason that patients get an abscess, believe it or not, is bad luck. Okay? I can wake up tomorrow with erectile abscess. I hope I don't, but I can. There's six or eight glands that live around the anal canal. They help lubricate the stool for you to have a bowel movement. You get a little bit of stool that can get trapped into those little ducts that can cause an infection. We name the infection based on where that location of the abscess is. Okay, in the bottom picture on the right, it can be an ischiorectal abscess. It's in the ischiorectal space, that the uh, fatty space here. They can be supralevator, above the levator muscle, perianal, intrasphincteric. I told you colorectal surgeons aren't very smart. We have to keep on our names uh, very easy. But the interesting thing about the way a rectal abscess patient presents is they start the pain, but the pain increases with time and doesn't let up. It's not associated with bowel movements. It's not associated with bleeding. These patients will say, I, my butt is killing me. I can't get in a comfortable position. I could not sleep last night. Or they start having urinary difficulties. If you're having urinary difficulties, you got an abscess till proven otherwise. You may or may not see fe have fever. You may or may not have swelling. Uh, but all those things, based on history, more often than not, we can tell what's going on. The treatment of a rectal abscess is drainage, okay? And I'm going to say this again. The treatment of a rectal abscess is drainage, okay? It is not appropriate, nor is it standard of care, to wait for the abscess to ripen. I've heard that before, okay? This is not a cantaloupe. We don't wait for anything to ripen. If you think the patient has an abscess, that needs to be surgically drained because it can cause significant amount of problem, spread, sepsis, death. Sometimes we give antibiotics if there's a lot of redness of the skin, but the treatment of erectile abscess is not antibiotics alone. It is surgical drainage plus or minus antibiotics. So I've talked a lot about the different anorectal diseases that we see. And before we get into the cases, does anybody have any questions? Thanks, Dr. Cohen. If all the attendees can enter in the passcode today and any questions that you might have. I don't see anything as of yet, Dr. Cohen. So you can continue with the presentation and we can hold those off um, for the next um, Q&A. Okay, I do want to bring up one point, a very common question that I get asked a lot about when I'm trying to decide the differences between, you know, if I'm examining the patient, let's say I have a patient with severe rectal pain, and I can't really tell what's going on, and they don't let me examine them, okay? That is not an uncommon scenario. It's not that they're mad at me that they don't want me to op uh, examine them, it's their butt hurts, okay? By definition, and this is what we teach, if you cannot adequately do a rectal exam because of severe pain, you go to the operating room. There is nothing else in between. So why do I say that? Okay? It's, it's not a very big area down there. There's only so many things it's going to be. So despite the laboratory work, CAT scan is not a test that we normally do for looking at anorectal pathology. I bring my digital bioprobe. What is my digital bioprobe? It's my finger. It's my finger in my eyes and talking to you. 99% of the time, I can make a diagnosis based on what, how you presented and what I'm seeing. If I cannot do an adequate rectal exam, either at the, in the ER, in the clinic, because of severe pain, you're going to the operating room. It's only one of three things it's going to be. 
okay? It's going to be an acute fissure, the tear that I showed you. Patients can get such severe spasm that I can't do an adequate exam. If that's the case, I can fix it in the OR once I put you to sleep. The second thing it may be is an intrasphincteric abscess, a small abscess that's not giving swelling, not giving redness, not giving fever, no systemic symptoms, but again, so much spasm of the anal canal, I can't examine you. If I find an abscess, I drain it. The third thing it may be is a thrombosis or a blood clot of an internal hemorrhoid. That's not that common, but I have seen that before. So if you, if you have a rectal exam that you cannot adequately perform and the patient's presenting uh, complaints with rectal pain, you got to fix it. The most dangerous time for a patient to be in a hospital is when they don't have a diagnosis. That's important to remember when you're looking at these different cases. If we don't have a diagnosis for you, you're in trouble because I don't know what to do with you. So if, I, if I'm seeing you in the ER with severe rectal pain and I don't have a diagnosis, i got to give you a diagnosis. If I miss the rectal abscess, your septic can die. Probably a bad idea. The thrombos external hemorrhoid, I can excise that. The fissure, I can fix that. But it's very important to do the adequate rectal exam. And again, this is what we talked about before. What's the treatment of a rectal abscess? And I've reviewed plenty of charts where it wasn't ripe enough and they got sent to do something the next day and something bad happened. So if the diagnosis is a rectal abscess, that needs drainage in a timely fashion. Okay? Let's talk about the first case. So the first case I want to talk to you about is a office procedure that we do for hemorrhoids. So we talked about hemorrhoids. We talked about internal hemorrhoids. We talked about external hemorrhoids. We talked about the internal hemorrhoids, bright red, painless, rectal bleeding. We treat them if you're symptomatic. As I started to say in the beginning, we have three different therapies for hemorrhoid, hemorrhoid treatment. I can do office, I can do office, um, sorry, medical therapy, keeping your stool soft, topical therapy, those types, sit bath, okay? But if you continue to have symptoms, I'm going to then offer the second thing, which is office-based procedures. There's about five or six different office-based procedures. The most common one that is done in this country, it's done thousands of times a day, is hemorrhoidal banding. So hemorrhoidal banding is a way for me to excise or cut out the tissue, internal hemorrhoids. I can do work inside your rectum, and you don't feel that, and you can be wide awake talking to me. I know it sounds weird, but... Right where the level of the hemorrhoids are, there's something called the dentate line. The nerve fibers proximal to that towards the head are different than the nerve fibers distal to that. So that's why in internal hemorrhoidal bleeding, since you're above the dentate line, it's painless rectal bleeding. It doesn't hurt. It hurts. The external hemorrhoid is what hurts, but not the internal. So rubber band ligation is a simple, should be simple, <laughs> outpatient technique that I visualized using an anoscope, the internal hemorrhoid, and I placed this black rubber band, that's exactly what it is, around the tissue as I grab it, and that causes ischemia, the bottom little picture there, ischemia, lack of blood flow, the hemorrhoid tissue falls off, and that creates a scar to stick the hemorrhoidal tissue to the underlying sphincter muscle. It's it works 90% of the time. It's used for grade 1, 2, and 3 hemorrhoids. It's outpatient, not painful. You can do it awake. Sometimes it's more than one treatment, but it's better than surgery. Surgery is miserable. So I have a 34-year-old patient who presented to his doctor for hemorrhoidal banding. He was complaining of bright red rectal bleeding. He had failed medical therapy, and he was set up for banding. No problem. Came to the office the next week, had a routine band, one quadrant. There's basically three hemorrhoidal bundles. We generally will do one or two at a time. It may increase the pain. There are some significant side effects that can happen that we'll talk about. But he essentially, otherwise healthy, zero medical problems, had a three-week-old baby at home, had one quadrant hemorrhoid banded. Three days later, he called back the doctor. He was having fevers, nausea, vomiting, 
chills. Doctor said, let me take a look at you. Comes to the office the next day. Now he's post-op day four. Didn't have a fever. Vital signs were stable. Had some rectal pain. The doctor looked into the hemorrhoids. The band was gone at this point. I believe it was day five. Um, and said, you know, you probably have some spasm. Let's put you on some nitroglycerin ointment. That's something we use for spasm and go home. Three days goes by. He's getting more and more sick. Nausea, vomiting, chills, severe rectal pain. He gets work in again. This is now post-op day number eight. Uh, not post-op day, but day number eight from the band. Comes into the doctor, says, you know, you don't look so good. Go to the emergency room. In the emergency room, he's an obvious perianal sepsis. Fever of 102.9. Blood pressure of 90. They give him some fluid. His white count is 34,000. I'm not making this up. His lactic acid is 2.1. They do a CAT scan, of course, because everybody gets a CAT scan. Okay? The CAT scan shows lots of inflammation, no drainable abscess. He gets a follow-up lactic acid that's now down to 1.9. The ER doctor knows he has to be admitted because he came in with a fever and a white count. His fever is better. He gets morphine. He gets some Tylenol. CAT scan shows no drainable collection. The ER doctor calls the colorectal surgeon on call at home and says, I have a patient. Well, we're not sure what he said. He said, I have a patient. Here's the story. The colorectal surgeon goes ahead and admits the patient, accepts to admission, accepts the patient for admission. During the night, patient starts getting worse. Six o'clock in the morning, patient has a white count now of 59,000. His lactic acid is 5.0. His blood pressure has been 80. He's been getting three liters of fluid. He was seen by the hospitalist. They gave more fluid. By the time the colorectal surgeon gets there, it's now 9 o'clock in the morning. He rolls him over. This is the first time, this is the first time somebody's actually done a rectal exam. First time somebody's done a rectal exam. 9 o'clock in the morning, he's hot day 8 from a band with a significant problem. During the night, he also went into urinary retention, needed a Foley catheter. The colorectal surgeon rolled him over. There was brown, foul-smelling, dead necrotic tissue. He goes to the operating room for debridement. They, debr they cut out as much tissue as they can, get him to recovery room. On the way to the ICU, he codes, he arrests, and he dies. 34-year-old rubber band ligation for a simple hemorrhoid. Lots of problems in that case. If you have a complication from a procedure, you need to be able to take care of it. That's thing number one. So standard of care requires any type of anorectal discomfort. You should not have pain three days after a rubber band. The pain from a band, first of all, most patients don't have pain at all. You sh I should be able to do this from you wide awake. It was documented he had no pain after the band, developed pain three days later. The subje all the subjective findings, all the objective findings, that was a problem. So. This particular case, delay, delay in treatment, and the causation is actually he died. He died from sepsis from a rubber band. It is a known complication of sepsis from rubber band ligation. This was failure to recognize and a significant poor outcome. Second case I was involved in. This was a hemorrhoid surgery complication. So. As the third thing we can do for a hemorrhoidal disease, obviously, we can do excisional therapy. I can either, you know, cut the hemorrhoids out with a scalpel, or I can do the stapled hemorrhoidectomy, but there are known complications of hemorrhoids, meaning any surgery has complications. But I can, if I get cut too deep, I can cut your muscle, make you incontinent, I can take out too much tissue, I can make a narrowing. You can get an infection. You can get persistence of your hemorrhoids. But this was a 54-year-old um, nurse who had symptomatic hemorrhoids, failed medical therapy, failed office procedures, and went to a surgeon and decided to, he offered her a stapled hemorrhoidectomy, okay? Stapled hemorrhoidectomy is a technique 
been around for a long time, has potential complications. Unfortunately, the surgery went well. Unfortunately, she came to me six weeks after the surgery. She could not have a bowel movement. She could not have a bowel. When I tried to examine her in the office, I could, believe it or not, and I've seen a lot of anuses, I promise you, I could not find her anal opening. What had happened during surgery is that if you cut or take out or excise too much of the anoderm, you will get a severe stenosis. Such a severe stenosis that it's very difficult to fix. I did a couple of operations to try to open up her anal canal with an anoplasty. I did a temporary loop bileostomy to let it, everything heal. She wound up with a permanent colostomy. I could not fix her rectum. I sent her to somebody else to see if they could try. They said, no, impossible. She had such a long, narrowed anal canal that was scarred down. And once you cut that tissue out, there is no going back. So she wound up with a proctectomy. I took her rectum out. She has a permanent colostomy. Again, from a complication, routine hemorrhoid surgery, which is a problem. The third case I want to talk to you about is, you know, and this was on the, you know, this is a well-known case of a missed uh, abscess. So, you know, the biggest reasons for a colorectal surgeon or a general surgeon is going to be error in diagnosis, misdiagnosis, or delay in diagnosis. And the problem with around the anal canal is things go bad very quickly. I mean, to have a 34-year-old with perianal sepsis die in the recovery or, you know, in the PACU, that's ridiculous. Otherwise, healthy person. So, and somebody that doesn't bring any comorbidities. But this particular case is actually a 17-year-old who went to the clinic. For what, he, what, he, what he told the doctor was, I have a hemorrhoid because my butt hurts. I hear that all the time, okay? He was examined by a second-year resident, and, and, and I'm not making this up, he was diagnosed with a hemorrhoid without examining the patient. But think about that. Think about that. I don't know why everybody's so scared of rolling somebody over and looking at the butt. I mean, I know... <laughs> that patients don't like it. I don't like my pulling my pants down either. I promise you. <laughs> but if you're going to make a diagnosis, you probably should look at it. So he, without looking at it, the second-year resident, which is under the guidance of the attending colorectal surgeon, was give, given a uh, diagnosis of hemorrhoid, was given a suppository, had persistent pain. Eight months later, eight months later, this was a 17-year-old, so the mom calls back the, you know, the doctor to look. He's still not any better. This was a telephone call, and over the telephone, the doctor prescribed more of the medication, and no referral was made to to be seen by anybody. Over the next 14 months, so over a year, this poor 17-year-old couldn't sit down. Multiple trips to the ER clinic was actually diagnosed with a pilonidal abscess. We didn't talk a lot about that, but that's a abscess infection in the lower spine, very, very common. The problem is the longer this abscess sits there, or whether it's around the anus or around the, the uh, perineum or the low back, these things can grow and spread and cause multiple sinus tracts and infections. He had about eight different operations, excision of all the tissue, plastic surgery flaps, and obviously the second-year resident as well as the attending doctor, delay in diagnosis with significant causation. It was a $10 million settlement for error in diagnosis. You can't make it – you can't give treatment to somebody. If you don't have a proper diagnosis, you can't have a proper diagnosis if you don't look at the area. So – this poor kid at 17, my older brother had a pilonidal abscess, you roll it over and you look, and if you don't know, you ask somebody. But this was a simple, simple fix. A simple diagnosis would have prevented a lot of problems, and unfortunately it went to a, uh, went to a what we talked about to that case. So really in summary, you know, it's very important to take a history from the patient. And I tell this to the medical students all the time, I guess because I'm, I'm too old. 
you know, 90% of the time you should be able to make a differential diagnosis get an idea of what you think is going on with the patient by talking to them. Common things are common. We are not going to be right 100% of the time. That's fine. That's why we have diagnostic imaging. It seems like to me, <laughs> the older I get and being involved in some of the younger kids as well, is, is that we've done it exactly in reverse. We don't talk to the patient. We don't look at the patient. We get the CAT scan, and then we try to figure out what's going on. Are, are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, so it's important that the the, the um, diagnostic imaging is confirmatory to the signs and symptoms of the way the patient presents. That's a much better way to try to figure out what's going on. And it's important to, to choose the treatment option to best help the symptoms. We, all, we don't always start with surgery. Yeah, the other thing that I tell uh, the residents is that as a surgeon, you're going to have complications. That's okay. It's not normal not to have complications. It's if you're not having complications, either you're lying about it or you're not doing enough surgery. But if and when you get a complication, the first question that anybody is going to ask you is, and it sounds simple, did the patient need an operation? Did the patient need an operation? I cannot tell you the number of charts that I've looked at that have major complications. Let's go back to that 34-year-old with the hemorrhoidal banding. When you actually look at that patient's chart, guess what? He was never offered medical therapy. He was never offered medical therapy. Are you kidding me? Here's a 34-year-old healthy guy with a three-week-old baby that has a simple outpatient procedure that's dead. Nobody ever said, why don't you try a suppository? They were, he wasn't pushing his hemorrhoids back in. They weren't hanging out. He had a little bleeding when he wiped. I mean, that, that's a problem. So if and when you get a complication, was the surgery indicated? Did you try medical therapy? That's fine. If you get the complication, as long as it's recognized in a timely fashion and treated, that's okay. It's also important to refer when appropriate and document the referral. And obviously, the digital bioprobe, which is my favorite slide there on the bottom right, that's going to be your most important instrument to try to figure out what's going on. If and when you rely on the CAT scan, that's going to be a problem. Back again to that hemorrhoidal banding patient that died. You know I'm fixated on that case. Is, is part, of the de part of the defense for the colorectal surgeon that was sitting home in bed when he got the report from the ER doctor was, well, he didn't, the ER doctor didn't tell me how sick he was, number one. Well, that's not good enough. You're making an assessment. You better rely on yourself and not somebody else. It's trust but verify. I don't trust anybody. If I'm making the decision, it's my patient, it's my responsibility. That's thing number one. Thing number two is the, you know, the CAT scan said there was nothing drainable. Well, just because you don't have an abscess that's drainable doesn't mean you don't need surgery because this patient wound up with, you know, dead tissue or a severe surgical site infection that never had anything drainable. So the defense of he didn't, you know, they didn't tell me and there was nothing drainable, not that good. You have a sick patient. The, the diagnosis was not in question. You knew there was a band there. You knew the patient couldn't urinate. You knew the patient had a fever of 102.9. You knew the patient had a white count of 34,000 that went up to 59,000. What do you think was going on? So very important, refer when you don't know. We don't have to know everything in medicine. It's, it's do they need to be admitted? What do we think is going on? What's the best diagnostic imaging to help confirm the diagnosis, and I hope everybody learned something of interest today. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. If all the attendees can enter in the passcode for today and any questions that you might have. We do have a few questions. The first question, how does lifestyle affect the frequency or occurrence of any of these issues? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So. You know, we don't see hemorrhoidal disease or fissures in animals. 
because and it's kind of silly. They don't walk upright. So we all walk upright. Uh, there, you know, what we strive for is soft, bulky, non-straining bowel movements. And having said that, there are plenty of patients that I've seen that look. I have one bowel move in a day. I'm not overweight. I work out all the time. But they have hemorrhoidal issues or they have a tear. So a fissure, the crack or a tear that I showed you, doesn't only have to be soft stool. We've all had diarrhea before. You got a little food poisoning. You have diarrhea from something. The body knows you're not supposed to have an accident. So if you have a lot of liquid stool delivered to the rectum, you can get some spasm of the muscle that can also create the fissure. So that's fissures you can get just doing everything you're doing right. Same thing for rectal abscess. Lifestyle has nothing to do with that. I operated on my senior partner. He woke up one day and said, you're not going to believe it. I got pus coming out my butt. I got an abscess. So I can get all these things just like you can get all these things, but, you know, extra fiber in the diet, you know, drinking plenty of fluids. We still recommend six to eight glasses a day. Soft, bulky, non-straining bowel movement. And if and when there's a problem, get it examined. Next question, how do you diagnose fissure or, or abscess in emergency room? So basically a lot of it's by history. 80% of the time it's going to be history. So it's going to be, um, you know, when did you get the pain? So an abscess patient, say for two days, I started a little pain, but the pain's been getting worse and worse and worse. In general, you, uh, you diagnose all of these things by rolling the patient over and examining them. Abscess, you usually see tenderness, or you feel tenderness, you see some swelling, you may see some redness, but very gentle. The patient knows you're going to hurt them. Very gentle. You palpate around. Most 99% of the time, I can give you a diagnosis by hearing how you presented, when are you having the pain, and feeling around, gently feeling around the anal canal. Next question. What is the correct exam for complaints of rectal pain? I handled a case where cream and bath was recommended. A tumor was found that was aligned, uh, alleged to have become invasive within 60 days because the full exam was not completed. And I'll push that to the yeah, side. So, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's, yeah. So a couple of things about that question. It, so in general, there's two kinds of invasive cancers, and this is a missed cancer diagnosis, and I've reviewed a lot of these different things. There's a lot of issues with this one. In general, there's two kinds of cancers that can happen around the anal canal. There's squamous cell carcinoma. That's what, believe it or not, for all, all of us old people, that's what Farrah Fawcett died of. Nobody did a rectal exam on her. I would have done it. Nobody asked me. But she had metastatic squamous cell carcinoma, and there's adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinoma, garden variety cancer. Most of these cancers, the majority, more often than not, are slow-growing tumors. They're not fast. So when you say it became invasive in 60 days, that generally that's not true. So I don't know. There's really no good tumor biology. We do have some tumor biology, but not 60 days. So more likely than not, a 60-day or two months is not really a delay because even if that patient had that, that would have been found the 60 days before, more likely than not, based on a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability, that was invasive at the time. But the question does beg, however, is that if I can't do a rectal exam and I think you have a fissure, okay? So I didn't do an adequate rectal exam. I documented I, I didn't do an adequate rectal exam. What is a reasonable time course for me to bring you back to take a look? And it's probably within that time course, so 30 to 40 days. I mean, I would generally tell you a month. There's no standard of care for that, but I want to make sure you're better. And if you're not better, I want to see you back. So generally, if I can't do a rectal exam, I'm, I'm questionable about the diagnosis, you're not that sick, I start medical therapy, you're coming back somewhere in that 30 days for a good rectal exam, and that's what I'm doing. And if I can't do it, then I'm going to do something. I'm either going to put you to sleep in the OR, I can take you to the GI lab and look in there with a scope, but I'm going to do a rectal exam. But 60 days is a very short time for it to become normal and then become something invasive. 
Next question. Is great advice to follow up with a doctor if you're in pain after procedure. What should you do if your doctor reassures you that you're fine or brushes you off as that's normal without yeah. taking you seriously? Yeah, and that's exact. Go, let's go back to the case that I'm in love with. It's that with the hemorrhoidal banding. That's that's exactly what happened. I mean, that's that's it. I'm not sure how to answer that question. I mean, go go find another doctor, get another opinion, walk into an emer into an urgent care. I mean, that that's a tough one. That that's why there's medical legal suits because. You know, that doctor that did the band on the 34-year-old initially blew him off and said, you're fine, and that he wasn't fine. And he knew he wasn't fine, but he, you know, people still listen to their doctors and respect what they say, and he had a good reputation. But, yeah, if, if you know, be be proactive in terms of your health care. It's about the best. But a lot of patients don't do that, as you know. <laughs> patients will listen to their doctor, and if they say, you're fine, you're fine. But that's not always the case. Next question. In an emergency room setting with patient complaint of pain, is exam required to meet standard of care before diagnosing hemorrhoids? It depends what you see. So if I roll you over, if you have rectal pain, I roll you over and I see a big thrombose external hemorrhoid, I just made the diagnosis and I'm not going to put my finger in your butt. I'm going to say, looks like a thrombose hemorrhoid. We'll start topical therapy. Either I can excise it, don't excise it, but now you're getting follow-up. The follow-up is what's important. So you don't have to do the rectal exam. If you are trying to make a diagnosis, um, but it's, a, it's an individual case. So let's go back to the hemorrhoidal banding case, which is my favorite case. The ER doctor who saw the patient never did a rectal exam. The hospitalist four hours later when he was getting worse never did a rectal exam. And there was a good 10 hour delay where he would have been salvageable because a rectal exam at that point would have more likely than not shown, you know, when you get a surgical site infection, it would have shown grayish, foul smelling fluid coming out. They would have said, something's not right here. I know there's nothing drainable on the CAT scan, but this anus is not a normal exam. So in that particular case, the lack of doing a rectal exam to identify the seriousness of a known patient with a fever of 102.9, a lactic acid of 2, a white count of 34,000, and not being able to urinate would have made a difference in, in that particular patient's life. Next question, does abscess equal pain? In general, yes. I don't know that I've ever seen a patient with a rectal abscess that does not have pain. So I would, I, yeah, I've never seen a patient with a rectal abscess that doesn't have pain. Now the abscess can rupture spontaneously and they can feel better, but in general, an, a rectal abscess causes pain, yes. Next question, how do you determine when to test for pulmonary rectal cancer? At what point do you order additional testing? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, I, I don't know if I did the webinar last year. So the current guidelines for colorectal cancer screening have changed. Hasn't quite caught up to all the insurance companies, but in general, men and women over the age of 50 it's gone down to age 45. The American Cancer Society and some of the GI societies and the colorectal society says we go down to now age 45. I'm sure nobody in the audience here is over 45. But men and women, 45 and up, we recommend a screening colonoscopy. So what does screening mean? Screening means you do not have symptoms. If you have blood in your stool, if you have change in bowel habits, if you have a family history of colon cancer and polyps, colon cancer or polyps, that's not screening. That's you have family history, okay, or you have symptoms, but pure screening. I don't have blood in my stool, no change in bowel habits, nobody in my family has colon cancer or polyps. American Cancer Society says starting at age 45, total colonoscopy. If you have symptoms, you start earlier, 
but if you but if you have rectal bleeding from your hemorrhoids, you have no other symptoms. I do your hemorrhoidectomy surgery. Your hemorrhoids are gone, and you still have bleeding. You get a colonoscopy. If you have, if I diagnose you with an anal fissure, and you're 50 years old, well, and you're 30 years old, anal fissure. I see your fissure. I treat your fissure. You had some bleeding. I heal your fissure. Your fissure's gone. Your bleeding's gone. I would not do a colonoscopy. So it kind of depends where you are. If you're 60 and you have an anal fissure and you have some bleeding and I fix your fissure and your bleeding stops, wait a second, you're 60. Have you ever had your screening colonoscopy? Ooh, your mom had colon polyps. You need a colonoscopy. So it's very individual, depends on the patient. If their anorectal symptomatology does not improve with how they presented, then further diagnostic imaging is warranted. Next question. How common is the use of med uh, magnetic renaissance imaging to confirm diagnosis of anorectal problems? Very, very seldom. Yeah, we don't use MRI that much. I will use MRI for complicated perianal Crohn's disease and patients that have so many, you know, Crohn's, inflammatory bowel disease condition, unknown etiology. Significant number of patients have perianal disease. They can have abscesses. They can have fistulas. I'm going to use MRI to see how extensive, does, you know, how deep is the fistula. That's thing number one. I'll use MRI for what we call MR defecography. I see a lot of patients with functional disorders of the anal rectum, rectoceles, rectal prolapse, enteroceles, obstructive defecation syndrome, those types of things. So MR is used for that, MR defecography. Uh, and it's also used in some cases for staging uh, for rectal cancer. But CT is still pretty good. We use trans, you know, if it's that low, we use transrectal ultrasound um, to, to look at the stage of the tumor. Does it go through the walls? Does it have any lymph nodes? But mostly MRI is used for the functional disorders uh, or complicated perianal Crohn's and or in some locations for staging of rectal cancer. Next question. What are treatment options for anal fissure, and how do you know when to change treatment? Yes, excellent question. So there's two kinds of fissures. There's acute, not acute one, like cute, but acute, A-C-U-T-E, acute fissures and chronic fissures. In general, if I tear my anal canal today and I start medical therapy, which is soaking in a hot tub, the fiber, topical, anal, topical medication, four to six weeks, that fissure will heal, okay? So in general, an acute fissure, 50% of patients will go on to heal with local therapy. The other 50% go on to form a chronic fissure. So a chronic fissure, I deter so how do I know it's chronic? Either by time. So if you come to me and you say, for the last six months, doc, every time I have a bowel movement, my ass is killing me, and I see a chronic fissure. Six months, I can put anything I want on there, that needs to be that needs to be surgically excised. That's thing number one. Thing number two, there are some things that I see when I examine you that make me think it's a chronic fissure. Number one, if the lining of the tissue has been denuded and I see exposed internal sphincter muscle. If I'm staring at your sphincter muscle and you tell me you've had pain for only one week, not even close. And I've had men, men do that to me all the time. They give me their story, two weeks of pain, okay, let me take a look, and I'm looking at a chronic fissure. I see exposed internal sphincter muscle, I see granulation tissue, something called the hypertrophy anal papilla and skin tag, that takes months for it to develop, right? I see rolled up heaped edges from an ulcer, that takes several months to get there, and I examine, I go back, I say, okay, when did your pain really start? Yeah, I know, it's been there for a while. So you can't make that up. So it, it, by time is one, by the look of the fissure, and really any lack of, you, know, you can have an acute fissure, but if you don't get better over a period of time, fissure patients are miserable. I don't know if anybody out there has had a fissure, 
but they are so happy when we fix them. When your butt hurts with every bowel movement, you are not feeling that. So most patients, 50% go on to heal. The other 50%, if it's a long time, then we offer surgical therapy, which is a lateral internal sphincterotomy, outpatient. I actually cut the internal sphincter muscle halfway up to the level of the dentate line, put one stitch in there. It is the most successful operation we do. The patient's first bowel movement, it's like, ah, that's so much better because you really release the spasm, and that's why it works so well. Next question. Can vision lead to abscess, and what is the usual time frame? Yeah, so a fissure... Because you have exposed sphincter muscle, a fissure can lead to an abscess. There is no time frame. I've seen patients that have had fissures. We plan surgery. They're not getting better with medical therapy. They want, they want to put off surgery for whatever reason for a few weeks, no problem. The day before they call me, they're, they're having increasing rectal pain. They've developed an abscess. Any open wound around the anal canal, because stool's going by it, surprise, can get infected. They all don't. There is no usual time frame. Some patients can develop an abscess. Some don't. Next question. Does celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, increase risk for any of these conditions, inflammation, such that the doctor should screen for celiac sensitive uh, gluten sensitivity or evaluate patient symptoms differently? And I'll put that on the screen. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, gluten sensitivity, celiac disease is a whole different ballgame, but gluten sensitivity is so common. I mean, <laughs> geez, I can talk to you all another hour on the whole gluten sensitivity. So in general, no. However, patients that eat, if they're gluten sensitive and they have, you know, the typical irritable bowel syndrome, the bloating, the diarrhea, that the 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 alteration in bowel habits is what is what causes the anorectal problems. So anything that causes, you know, in ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome, small bowel overgrowth, celiac disease, getting a viral infection and you have diarrhea for three days just because you picked up a stomach bug or you had food poisoning, that can give you anorectal disease. But, you know, the problem is these things are so common, anorectal diseases are common, GI symptomatology is so common, it's more of a correlation versus a causation. So again, I always strive back to talk to the patient about their bowel movement, soft, bulky, non-straining bowel movement. You can have a problem if you're constipated and strained. You can have a problem if you have too much diarrhea. The extra fiber kind of helps regulate that to keep it more even keel, but we don't normally screen for celiac unless patients are having a serious problem or gluten sensitivity because it's so common. And our last question, when, if ever, is it acceptable to do a virtual colonoscopy or an at-home test? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So the American Cancer Society, if patients don't want to have a colonoscopy, that's fine. There's other things that they can do for screening that's perfectly acceptable and also standard of care. One of them is the fecal DNA test, and that's fine, but that has to be done every year, thing number one. Thing number two, virtual colonoscopy is fine. We do it here where I work. The problem with the virtual colonoscopy is that some patients don't understand it's going to miss lesions less than a centimeter. Okay, Usually cancers are bigger than that, and that's thing number one. Thing number two, they still have to take a bowel prep. So you've got to drink all that stuff. And thing number three, if you find a polyp, you need a colonoscopy. So when I explain that to the patient, you got to take the PrEP, you got to do the test. If you have a polyp, guess what? You're coming back to drink the PrEP again because now I'm going to do the colonoscopy. So it's perfectly reasonable to do a virtual colonoscopy. The home tests are fine as long as you're in the right algorithm of how often to do it. And if it's positive, especially the home test, you get the colonoscopy. You don't I have this conversation a lot, but my my card was only one out of three cards was positive. Maybe I should repeat the cards. Maybe the, no. Positive is positive. You go get the colonoscopy. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. That is um, all of our questions that we have for today. 
please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must have attended for the full 60 minutes of this presentation. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that all certificates will be sent out via email in 24 to 48 hours. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Dr. Stephen Cohen, for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Dr. Cohen or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case you are working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. This concludes our program for today.